these people that are involved in the gang, they're just terrorizing their own people. Tonight, how a Cree community is trying to protect their families from drugs and violence. Step up efforts to protect indigenous women and girls from all forms of discrimination, violence and abuse. World countries at the UN take note of a persistent Canadian problem. And it's my prediction that, that they're just, just going to round this agreement through. And lawyers say 75 million in fees is low, while 60 scoop survivors shame Canada for a process they say is already not fair. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News, I'm Dennis Ward. Some members of the Big Island Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan fear that gang activity in the community is growing. In fact, some members took matters into their own hands and tried to get alleged gang members to leave the community. But as APTN's Chris Stewart reports, the problem isn't getting any better. My brother got shot over there at the T-Road. It was dark and I just heard the gunshot that killed him and that that stays with you forever. Jocelyn says she lost her brother Jordan to gang violence in 2016. He was shot in the head just outside Santly's home. She asked APTN not to publish the name of her brother's killer. She fears for retribution. He was sentenced to eight years in prison for manslaughter. She says that since his death, gang activity has increased in Big Island Lake Cree Nation. She says the West Side Outlaws are dealing drugs to adults and children alike. They're bringing drugs into the community, meth, giving it to the kids, some, the moms, getting them hooked. These kids are like 10, 11, 12, and they're doing meth, crack. She has four children. She worries about their safety and the safety of everyone in the community. These people that are involved in the gang, they're just terrorizing their own people. And it's got to stop. We're, they're, hurting, they're hurting their own people, and I don't know why they would want to do that. The community doesn't have a police force, but they do have security guards. But Sandfly says they can only observe. The Saskatchewan RCMP say they are concerned about gang violence across the province. In 2016, 13 of 53 homicides were gang-related, one in four homicides. RCMP told APTN they have not observed an increase in gang activity on the reserve. Sandfly says some people are afraid to call and report incidents and to police. Late last week, after a community member received a broken jaw, a council member and a group of band members took action. I guess they said enough's enough before we lose another person. They went, they went house to house, not, I don't know if it's every house, but known places where these gang members frequent. They went to those houses, they found a few, they kicked them out of the, they dropped them off in the outskirts of the reserve and, and told them never to come back. <laughs> but, but I'm pretty sure they're still coming here. They can come back whenever they like. There are no barriers to stop them. APTN spoke with a council member. He refused to speak on camera. He did say off camera that leadership will be meeting to address the gang issue. That meeting won't come soon enough for Jocelyn Sandfly. She has already lost a family member and wants to keep the rest of her family safe. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Big Island Lake, Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. Located within the territory of the Algonquins of Barrier Lake, the community of Rapid Lake is facing a crisis. Plagued by social issues, the isolated community four hours northwest of Montreal is struggling to get the police services they need. Tom Fenario has that story. We're approaching our police station and um, as usual there is no police officers here. As the social crisis manager of Rapid Lake, Kathleen deschen often needs to deal with police when she can find them. I have stood out here and shout, shouted to the police 
and knocked on the door, banged on the door, and had to go back to the clinic and call them when I saw there was a police uh, vehicle here. The Shenkai says not only do the police rarely patrol the community, they don't come promptly when they're called. There's, there's like, there's no law in the community. A lot of uh, parents and women and families live in constant fear. In Rapid Lake, the Quebec Provincial Police, known as the SQ, are in charge of enforcing the law. The detachment also covers 12,000 square kilometers in the Gatineau Valley region. An SQ spokesperson told APTN that Rapid Lake's isolation can often lead to challenging situations where officers find themselves hundreds of kilometers away when a call comes in. According to this 2014-2015 expense report to the Ministry of Public Security, the SQ were given almost $1.3 million to solely police Rapid Lake's population of around 600. While the same detachment's 2015 bill to the municipality of Manawaki, with a population of about 4,000, was less than $280,000. APTN News has asked the SQ for more recent numbers, as well as a breakdown of how the money is spent policing Rapid Lake. They were not able to provide that before deadline. Meanwhile, Kaye Deschen says Rapid Lake is struggling without a constant police presence. She says the clinic she works at occasionally becomes the only safe place to go. Often the women will run to the clinic here and lock themselves in here. We, you know, we've had incidents where we've locked the doors of the um, person who, with the violent behavior is out there somewhere. Chief Casey Ratt says the ideal solution doesn't necessarily involve more SQ. They're mostly on the highway and, uh, you know, that's it's nothing we can do there because it's not our, uh, you know, it's the, the province's police, not ours, so. Rather, Rat would like to see a return of their own police force. I mean, I've been trying to get my policing back for a while now in terms of uh, when I first started in 2012. I was told that, you know, uh, go see the SQ, I mean, go see the province, the province says go see the feds, so, you know. But in order for that to happen, the Algonquins of Barrier Lake need to get out of third-party management. They're currently going through mediation with the federal government to regain control over their finances. They have an important meeting in August, which could see an end to 12 years of third-party management. This whole area here, we had a feast one time. I believe it was from this yellow from this house all the way to the last house on this street. Deshen Kaye feels these displays of community are becoming more rare in Rapid Lake. For the sake of the youth here, she hopes it can return, along with a consistent police presence. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Rapid Lake, Quebec. Hearings on the proposed 60 scoop settlement continued into its second and final day in Saskatoon on Friday. A federal judge heard from lawyers included in the agreement in principle and lawyers opposing the settlement. While survivors got the chance to speak on Thursday, many were disappointed with the process as a whole. Here's Brittany Hobson from Saskatoon. Approximately 30 survivors got to voice their objections on Thursday during a hearing for the proposed 60 scoop settlement. Two days were allotted for the hearings, but survivors found out on Thursday they weren't going to be able to speak on Friday. It was supposed to be two days, and then we were told yesterday that it's only one day, and today they're hearing arguments around the $75 million fees around the lawyers. So today it's for the lawyers to um, present their objections around the fees, but survivors, um, this is not a day for survivors. Colleen Rajat drove from Winnipeg to voice her objections, but was disappointed to learn survivors were given a time limit to speak. This is our first opportunity to appear in a courtroom setting where a judge is presiding over the objections, and you would think that he would want to know a little bit about our story. Survivors were told they had three minutes to voice their objections. The judge warned them if personal stories came out, he would have to interrupt, as it did not relate to the settlement at hand. And a lot of uh, individual 60s group survivors have waited 50, 60 years to tell their story, only to be told today, we don't want to hear your story. Robert Doucette is a Métis 60 scoop survivor and has been vocal about the exclusion of the Métis people in the settlement. He says the hearings have left him traumatized and with little faith survivors' concerns have been heard. And, and it's my prediction that, that they're just, just going to ram this agreement through. They had made up their mind already to, to ram it through. 
The proposed settlement will see a maximum of $750 million for individual survivors, $50 million for a healing foundation, and $75 million in fees for lawyers, for a total of $875 million. On Friday, one of the four law firms included in the agreement argued $75 million is reasonable because it amounts to 10% of the final settlement, while in other class action lawsuits, lawyers have received up to 30%. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Saskatoon. A second hearing on the proposed 60 Scoop settlement will take place in Toronto on May 29th and 30th. Canada was on the defensive in front of the United Nations Human Rights Committee in Geneva today. That story and much more coming up. Here's a look at Saturday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Sunny and 14 in Fredericton, 7 in St. John's. Minus 2 in Nain, Kuchuac and Le Grand. Sunny and plus 12 in Quebec City and Saguenay, 14 in Val d'Or. Sunny and 15 in Peterborough and North Bay, 16 under the sun in Ottawa. Sunny high of 16 in Sudbury, Timmins, Capus Casing and Sioux Lookout. Plus one under the sun in Churchill, a balmy 23 in Flin Flon. Sunny skies and 20 above in Winnipeg and Brandon. Over in Saskatchewan, 19 in Esteban, Regina and Yorkton. Even warmer in the north, 23 in Meadow Lake and Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. Canada defended its human rights record before the United Nations today. Early this morning, Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould spoke in Geneva at the UN's Human Rights Council. As APTN's Todd Lamoran reports, much of the three-hour discussion revolved around Indigenous peoples, as dozens of countries gave recommendations on what to do better. Canada is committed to achieving true, meaningful and lasting reconciliation based on the recognition and implementation of Indigenous rights as we continue along the path of decolonization. Much of Wilson-Raybould's opening remarks centered on her government's promises and policies. For example, supporting the legislation that will bring Canada's laws into harmony with UNDRIP. But one issue above all others was the subject of many countries' recommendations. We know the persistence of violence against women, particularly prevalent among indigenous women and girls. We therefore recommend stepping up efforts to protect victims of violence and ensure a sufficient number of adequate shelter for them. Step up efforts to protect indigenous women and girls from all forms of discrimination, violence and abuse. The United States recommends the following. One, appoint a permanent government interlocutor to report to the Assembly of First Nations on the status of the ongoing inquiry into the cases of missing and murdered indigenous women. About halfway through the review, a senior bureaucrat address the issue of murdered and missing women. And the Government of Canada is not waiting for the, income, the outcome of the inquiry to take immediate action with investments in women's shelters, housing, education, child welfare reform, and strengthening criminal laws and victim services and supports. But other nations had a wide range of recommendations regarding Indigenous people. We recommend that Canada prohibits the environmentally detrimental development of resources on the territories of Indigenous peoples without the free, prior and informed consent of those communities. Invest uh, in the preservation of endangered languages uh, spoken by people belonging, belonging to First Nations. Australia recommends Canada implement all of the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Canada has until this August to formally respond to everything it heard. And the next review of its human rights record will be four or five years from now. Todd Lamarand, APTN National News, Ottawa. The Yukon government is bringing in an independent investigator from BC to scrutinize their group homes after some department staff denied allegations of mistreatment of kids in care and said proper policies and procedures are being followed. But the Minister of Health and Social Services says new information has come forward to justify the external review. Health and Social Services Minister Pauline Frost suggests that her senior staff in the department have been misled in the last few months in how her department handled allegations of mistreatment of high-risk kids in government-run group homes. 
Frost says internal concerns in her department around policy, procedures and staffing is raising more questions than answers. We are all frustrated. Why? Because we have been not given the information or we're getting bits and pieces of information. The objective of this, the coming weeks, is for us to do an in-depth review and analysis of all of the information to determine what is true, what is validated, and how can we proceed from there to make some corrective actions. So, I don't think I Frost suggests that her senior staff in the department have been misled in the last few months in how her uh, department handled allegations of mistreatment of high-risk kids. Frost says internal concerns around policy, procedures, and staffing continues to raise questions. Meanwhile, uh, another dark chapter in Canada's history is also in the spotlight tonight. A class action lawsuit is in the works claiming Indigenous patients were subjected to medical experiments when so-called Indian hospitals were in operation. Gina Martin has more on one patient's harrowing experience that he still grapples with to this day. I went there when I was six months old till I was three. Klein Alexson says his first years as a child were spent at the Fort Quipel Sanitarium after doctors say he had a collapsed lung from tuberculosis. More like it was uh, a nightmare. A nightmare not even Alexson's handmade dream catchers can seem to erase, as he says he still has flashbacks of his time at Fort San. All I heard was kids crying and people crying. Alexson says he remembers being injected with unknown substances, which decades later he believes could be responsible for medical issues he now struggles with. Now I have seizures uncontrollable. It comes and goes. Doctors can't seem to diagnose Alexson's condition, and the cause may stem from medical experiments allegedly conducted on Alexson and other Indigenous patients back when Indian hospitals existed. Atrociously, Indigenous people were the subject of testing, and, and we, we seek compensation for that. A class action lawsuit was launched earlier this year seeking compensation and punitive action for the alleged wrongdoings Indigenous patients experienced in these hospitals. The federal government told CTV News in a statement, the abuse of children is tragic and unacceptable. The allegations that have been outlined in media articles on this issue are very troubling. The government takes issues and allegations of this type very seriously. Meanwhile, Alexson just hopes he can find out if the tests conducted on him as a child are the reason he is suffering today. Money is not important to me. It's my life is important to me. So one day his dreams can be of the future rather than the past. The disease found in some farmed Atlantic salmon may be linked to disease in farmed Chinook salmon. That's from a new study by a partnership of scientists from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Genome BC and the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Most studies in the past have been on farmed Atlantic salmon, but this new study shows the same strain of PRV is causing serious and potentially deadly disease in farmed Chinook salmon. In BC, there are both Atlantic and Chinook salmon farms that are farmed separately. The Pacific Salmon Foundation has not spoken against open net salmon farms until now, and they're saying they should be moved to land. It's a risk to wild salmon because it does demonstrate that PRB can cause a potentially fatal disease in Pacific salmon. And it's the exact same virus because we did the full genome sequencing of, of all the uh, materials. And therefore, that's why the Salmon Foundation took the next step of recommending that the wise choice would be to start moving to closed containment. An art club at a school in Thunder Bay is bringing out some major talent. It's a story you won't want to miss, and it's coming up after the break. Here's the rest of Saturday's weather outlook starting in sunny, warm northern Alberta, 24 in Fort McMurray, 20 under the sun in Medicine Hat, Calgary and Red Deer. Beautiful day on the west coast, 22 in Victoria, 24 in Campbell River, 24 under the sun in Fort St. John, sunny skies and 23 in Fort Nelson. 
Cooler in the Yukon, rain in 12 in Mayo, 8 in Rock River, and NWT, 16 in Trout Lake, Wrigley, and Yellowknife, minus 6 in Saks Harbor, plus 4 in Snow in Anubik, over 2 Nunavut, minus 4 in Arviet and Baker Lake, minus 10 in Repulse Bay, Snow and 7 below in Iqaluit, minus 11 in Igloo Lake. Welcome back. For students at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, the Art Club is more than just an after-school program. It's a way to inspire young artists. Will Fiddler tells us about their latest project from Thunder Bay. Ariana Chicane from North Caribou Lake enjoys the extracurricular activities available at her school. I didn't have supplies back home. And I, I saw an art club here and it looked fun. And I joined it. Yeah, that's how I got into it. The talent that comes from this club is on display all over Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, hanging in the city's airport and in exhibitions at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery. The art club is an outlet for students like Chicane who are attending high school away from home and family. It's like every once a week, but then I do art every day after school. Students have worked with well-known Anishinaabe artists like Saul Williams in the past, this year, they tried something new with local art educator Elizabeth Bissett. Yeah, stenciling is a medium that I work with. Um, I don't really consider myself a graffiti artist because I don't do ha like freehand spray painting, but I do do stencil work. The completed project, a spray-painted wall mural that reflects the different subjects at DFC. Uh, they selected all the images, and then from there we designed the stencils. They hand-cut them all, and then when it came up to the actual uh, spray painting of the mural, they chose where it would be positioned on the wall, what color it would be, the layering, and it was all collaborative from start to finish. Ariana and her cousin Robin did this piece by the late Anishinaabe artist Roy Thomas. Learned about him, or I found out about him in art class. Thomas's wife Louise owns Anishinaabe Art Gallery in Thunder Bay. She said it's important to support the young artists at DFC. There's a lot of uh, wonderful artists that are coming out of this, uh, out of this school, and you know, when, when you look at these young people, or even our people, you know, we have um, um, just natural talent. Thomas said she hopes the art club can inspire youth. We need to, we need to have these things to inspire other artists. You know, even if you're not from this school, you know, there's lots of talent out there. So I always encourage artists, you know, don't waste your talent. Do something with your talent. Chicane said it's been a fun experience. I like bringing stuff to life. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. Some good looking work there. That's your APTN National News for this Friday. For more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Stick around. APTN Investigates is next with an encore presentation of Rob Smith's Justice for Colton. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great weekend.